I'd like to uh, welcome everybody. My name is Alan Luxemburg, president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. This is our tw 21st lecture, uh, annual lecture in the Templeton Lectures on Religion and World Affairs, um, where we've uh, hosted uh, talks on um, different, different religions and world affairs. Uh, Rabbi Sachs uh, spoke about avoiding the clash of civilizations. Uh, George Weigel, the biographer of Pope John Paul II, spoke about the Pope and the dynamics of world history. Uh, we've hosted many talks on uh, Islam. We've only touched the uh, Orthodox Church uh, but once, uh, the second lecture in 1997 with uh, James Billington, then the Librarian of Congress, talking about uh, religion and the future of Russia. We'll have to go back to see if he was right about anything. <laughs> Uh, tonight we have a very unusual speaker who uh, served for 20 years in, as an Army intelligence officer uh, uh, with two tours of duty in Afghanistan and then went on to teach at the Naval War College where he taught insurgency, information warfare. And now he finds himself as the rector of the St. Mary Protection of the Holy the Atticos Parish in Allentown and professor of the St. Sophia Ukrainian Orthodox Seminary. Um, he is the editor of a website called Good Men Wear Black. If you Google it, you, if you Google it you'll find there's a movie by that name with Chuck Mor Norris. Uh, <laughs> he's here today to talk about the Ukraine conflict and the role of the Orthodox Church. The talk was titled by my colleague Eli Gilman of Little Green Men in Long Black Robes, The Role of the Orthodox Church in the Conflict in Ukraine. Please welcome Father Anthony Perkins. Yes. And I wasn't uh, born Orthodox or Ukrainian. So if you want to know how that happened, you can ask that later. It's a great title, by the way. Um, I really uh, thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be present here. And it's really humbling. I've, I know the list of people who have given this talk before, and it's uh, a high point for me to be on that same list. I'll, I'll be like the asterisk on there. This was the unusual <laughs> guest. It's also a blessing to be part of Mr. Templeton's Ministry of Spiritual Growth through broad ecumenical understanding. Um, and you know what, it's, it's great to be speaking with an audience that appreciates the fact that religious, the religious effect on anything is bound to be complicated. As you know, this isn't necessarily the case with every audience that you speak with. After 9-11, when I was working as a strategic military intelligence analyst, I was dismayed. You'd see these two extremes some analysts would fall into when it came to understanding and explaining the effect of Islam on the insurgencies in Afghanistan and Pakistan. At one extreme were those who assumed that religion was just a veneer for what was really going on. And at the other were those who thought that the insurgents had been brainwashed or using the old terminology had been you know, hit with the hypodermic needle, the hypodermic effect. They had been brainwashed by the Quran and their religious teachers to behave in certain ways. As you know, the truth is more nuanced. Even though there are certainly agitators who use religious language, symbols, and stories to manipulate people in opportunistic ways, the fact that people can be manipulated by these things has to be taken into account. And let me tell you, as a full-time teacher and preacher of religion, I can tell you that it takes a whole lot more than a holy book and a bunch of lectures and sermons to reach people's hearts and change their behavior. Last year you had a great lecture on, on religious violence. Now I encourage you to reflect back on that lecture and accept that the specific case of the effect of orthodoxy on the conflict of Ukraine is similarly important and complicated. So let me give you a little background about this, the little green men and what's going on. The Donbass, 
is that eastern part of Ukraine that borders Russia, and it is a war zone. There is a ceasefire, but it is routinely ignored. On one side, there are about 40,000 Ukrainian separatists, plus about 3,000 Russian volunteers, and upwards of, depending on who you ask, 10,000 Russian forces of various type. On the other side, there are about 60,000 Ukrainian troops to include this National Guard. It's a very interesting phenomenon where well, they took the militias and they just <laughs> made them into the National Guard. There have been over 10,000 fatalities and more than twice that many wounded. 1.5 million Ukrainians are internally displaced and almost a million have sought refuge outside the borders of Ukraine. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs estimates that the war has put the lives of five million people in eastern Ukraine at risk. <coughs> Moreover, and this is where my, my hat, theological hat comes in, the usual wartime processes of self-justification and of demonization, you know, the processes that kill men's souls, have been put into hyperdrive due to the information war. It is at least ironic, if not, to use a religious term, and you're going to have to get used to that, I'm going to use a lot, because they're in play. It is ironic, if not blasphemous, that some of the weapons in that information war were designed, <coughs> built, and even used by the Orthodox Church. Here's a quote from one of the main Orthodox leaders of Ukraine and one of the main shepherds of her people, Metropolitan Onufri, the leader of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which is under Moscow. He, he wrote, there is an unprecedented info war going on. Propaganda is destroying brotherly relations between peoples and is even destroying relations between relatives. Where can we look for salvation? How can we overcome the problems and division when the seeds of hostility and feud have been sown between the brothers in faith in abundance and they are already bearing their bloody fruit? Everything possible needs to be done to end the war and establish long waited for peace in Ukraine. And then he went on to go after the clergy, his clergy and the other clergy, and point out how unacceptable it is for pastors <coughs> of peace to be sowing this kind of hatred. My main approach tonight will be to share some of the religious stories and ideas from Russian and Ukrainian Orthodox history that are in play in this information war and to describe how they get used to legitimize one side or the other. This will include looking at Orthodoxy itself, not to convert you, but to see why it is so available for political agitation. The baptism of Kievan Rus, we're going to look at that so we can understand the importance of place. We'll look at the fragmentation of the early Kievan church to understand the weight of labels like heretic, schismatic, and unit. The third Rome and the Russian world, looking at those, will help us understand Russian Orthodoxy's sense of entitlement and sense of obligation. And then we'll look at how the West is understood by each side. Lord willing, I'll then conclude by describing some potential ways that these weaponized ideas can be beat back into plowshares or perhaps chalices. But before I go into those specifically religious things, I have to talk about the big story. I have to put those things into perspective. When we look at the information war, the religious symbols being used are very strong, but they are nowhere near as strong as the dominant ones used in the Ukrainian conflict. These are fascism and Russian imperialism. Why do these resonate so strongly? You know the history well. Russians live in places and have families that were decimated by World War II. The Great Patriotic War remains one of the few unambiguous high points in recent Russian history. 
and its symbols and its heroes, all of these things are embedded deep within the Russian soul. While only a small minority of Ukrainian nationalists are fascists, the imagery is strong enough and used often enough to make the threat of Ukrainian fascists a visceral and immediate concern to both Russians and Russian-speaking Ukrainians, especially when the Ukrainian government does things like passing discriminatory language laws that fit so easily and support that narrative. You are also no doubt aware that Ukraine was long under the control of both the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Ukrainian nationalism does not just celebrate the glories of Ukraine's past. Stories like the golden age of Kiev and the time of the Cossack hosts. It also recounts all the things Ukraine's northern neighbor has done to oppress, to Russify, and even destroy Ukrainians and Ukraine. Recent events like former President Yanukovych's capitulation on the EU accords in favor of closer ties to, with Moscow, Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea, and Russia's proxy war in Donbass are seen as yet more items on a long list of grievances that includes the Soviet purges against nationalist leaders and the Holodomor. Of course, there are also plenty of Ukrainians who see Russia as a generally positive force in the history of Ukraine. But it is unfortunate that no one has been able to develop a Ukrainian idea that might cut across these cleavages. Instead, what we've seen is election cycles, the Maidan, the annexation of Crimea, and the war in Donbass have deepened both of these cleavages. This has been exacerbated by the information war. I am not exaggerating when I say that Russian and Ukrainian nationalists live in completely separate worlds. We think we know what that's like due to our political polarization. It is worse. Russian religious motivators are strong, but they do not have the same impact as the anti-fascist and anti-imperialist motivations. <laughs> but I'm not going to stop my talk here. <laughs> there, I've covered the most important things. What are your questions? It's still worth looking at the role of religion. After all, there is a reason that Russian propaganda against Ukraine starts with fascist and Nazi, but then continues with the more religious terms, schismatic, unit and heretic. We in America were not as affected by World War II and communism as Russia and Ukraine, but our stories still include fascist, Soviet, and Russian villains, so we still have a good sense of why those labels are effective. However, feel, few of us here in America get religion. Feel of us, feel, few of us feel religion the way Russian and Ukrainian Orthodox do. So these terms do not really resonate with us. They are intellectual categories, but they resonate with, they are felt by Ukrainians and Russians. Unfortunately, the faith that has as it, one of its prime directives, the reconciliation of the nations, has been used to further polarize them. Let's talk now about that faith and why it is so useful for political agitation. So a little bit about orthodoxy. Orthodoxy, is a large and comprehensive system of beliefs and rituals, there'll be a test on this later, designed to accomplish God's will among mankind and in this world. When it is embraced by people and nations, it develops all of their moral muscles, or to use Jonathan Haidt's terms, their moral taste buds. The real purpose of this is to give people holy instincts that can then work along with their well-trained minds and their God-directed spirits so that they can love God and serve their neighbor and do all the wonderful things that orthodoxy was designed to accomplish on behalf of our neighbors, both friend and enemy. But if there is no discernment, if there is no humility, and if there is no love, then once all these moral muscles have been developed through orthodoxy, they can be, then be used to lift, or stepping out of the metaphor a bit, they can be used to destroy or justify or demonize pretty much anything. 
This is especially relevant for our current study when it comes to how orthodoxy encourages automatic deference to authority and sanctity of place. Everyone who knows anything about orthodoxy knows that it has a, a kind of rigid hierarchy and a theology of hierarchy that includes bishops and priests and deacons. But it also has rituals that reinforce that authority. When a lay person greets a priest or a bishop, or a priest greets a bishop, what they do in traditional cultures is they'll ask for a blessing and they'll kiss their hand, right? It's something, it, it left our culture long ago. It's still there. This, along with the structure of the liturgy, the way our liturgy is set up, everything that the laity done, do are, are done in, it's done in response to the priest or the deacon. There's also the homily. It's, it's one of those amazing bits of social science where you get someone to stand up and just, some of us are very boring. And what do people do? They're polite. They're, they act attentive. Okay, they may not be learning anything, but what they are, what's getting into here, into their instincts, their guts, is this deference towards authority. Okay? There's also the architecture and then the daily acts of restructuring diet and activities around a liturgical schedule. All these things reinforce the Orthodox Christian's instinctive deference to authority. It gives authority a moral weight. Orthodoxy also has a sacramental theology. It believes that matter is changed by grace. Right? I know it's very old-fashioned, very medieval. This is most obvious in the changing of the bread and wine. But it is also why we do other things like venerate the relics of saints. It is why we build churches in certain places and not others. It really is. This idea of the blessing of physical space is fundamental to the Orthodox worldview. A corollary of this is that some places are sacred. Some rituals that support this are how we divide our worship spaces. The way our movements change depending where we are in that space and our participation in mass pilgrimages to special places. Russians, Russians weren't just defending Putin when they were against Pussy Riot. They felt the offense viscerally. And so even if they didn't like Putin, there was cognitive dissonance that they had to overcome. None of these things, these rituals, are done so that orthodoxy can be politicized or even, to use a current term, weaponized. But without proper training, that is, without discernment, without humility, and without love, they can be used for both. How this can and has been used to manipulate people will become evident as we look through a few examples. Let's start with the baptism of Kievan Rus. And notice I said Kievan Rus. I didn't say Russia. Right? Kiev is the capital of Russia? No, no, it's the capital of Ukraine. But it's historically in incorrect to say the baptism of Ukraine. The basic facts regarding the baptism of Rus by St. Volodymyr in 988 are accepted by all sides in the conflict. So is the appreciation for the golden age that it ushered in for both the central part of the realm around Kiev in what is now Ukraine, and for the outer parts further north in what is now Russia. But what does it mean? We'll look at the ideological battle over the Russian world in a minute. But right now, let's look at how it was used to justify Russia's occupation and annexation of Ukrainian territory in the Crimea and even in the Donbass. I want you to listen to how President Putin used the Russian sense of sacred space and Russia's veneration of St. Volodymyr, or as they call him, St. Vladimir, <coughs> as the baptizer, uh, baptizer of Russia to justify his takeover of Crimea. This is what he said to Parliament in December of 2014. It was here in Crimea, in the ancient Chersonese, or as it is called in Russian chronicles, Korsun, that Prince Vladimir received baptism, and then he baptized all of Rus. And it was here on this sacred ground our ancestors for the first time and always recognized themselves 
as a single people. So just what the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is for those who profess Islam or Judaism is precisely how we are going to treat this place from now on and forever. I'm sure that you see the problems with this logic, <laughs> but I want you to understand that many, if not most, Russian Orthodox would not. President Putin's non sequitur resonates with the Russian Orthodox because they are human. And because they are human, they are subject to the finding from moral psychology that in moral decision making, instincts come first, with reasoning coming next to justify what one already feels or knows to be correct. As we discussed earlier, the Orthodox have a strong sense of the sacred, and the Orthodox knows that certain places are sacred. Again, this is reinforced by our behavior in liturgical space. The Orthodox have also been trained to defer to authority and to grant that authority a moral weight. When the authorities connect Crimea to the baptism of Rus through St. Vladimir and say that it is holy and should be under the control of true believing Russia, Russian believers tend to accept it as gospel, so to speak. Note that you have the same instincts among the Ukrainian Orthodox, but it leads to a different outcome, even for those who are under Moscow. And this should warn us that, again, it's complicated. Let me share a quote from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow, Pat Moscow Patriarchate. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate views Crimea as Ukrainian territory and has spoken out for the return of the peninsula to the control of Kiev. At the same time, the press secretary characterized the conflict in East Ukraine as intergovernmental and not interconfessional. We'll have more on that in a moment. It is obvious here that the Russian government, with the support of the Russian Orthodox Church, and it is pretty much guaranteed that support, the foreign ministry of the Russian government seeks closest possible ties with the Russian Orthodox Church and <coughs> vice versa. It is using this to legitimize an illegal action. <clears throat> this only works because of the way Orthodox builds up the mus moral muscles of believers. It's been in the, same, the same in Donbass. That is not where St. Volodymyr was baptized, but it is still seen as being sacred space, the territory that should belong to Holy Russia. And therefore, it should be under the control of Moscow. Okay. Um, and it is also unthinkable that such holy places would be under the control of heretics, schismatics, and unions. Now, to go on and understand why those two terms get used and why they have resonance, I want to look at another piece of Ukrainian history, the fragmentation of the Ukrainian church. You're probably familiar with that. You had Professor Billingsley not long ago, right? He may have spoken about how the Mongols came in and changed the course of history. What ended up happening, happening in Ukraine is the fragmentation of one faith and one church into at least five groups. These are the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Kievan Patriarchate, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, the Ukrainian Catholic Church, which is Orthodox in theology and liturgy, and the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, and of course, the Russian Orthodox Church. They worship the same, they believe the same, they tell very similar stories about themselves. All see and celebrate Kiev and Rus as their genesis, and considers themselves the true heirs of the Church of Kievan Rus. But the Russians have had the power to make their narrative the dominant one, both in Russia, and at least until recently, the main one taught in Ukrainian and Western schools and universities. If you studied Russia during the Cold War, that's exactly the story that you were told. But fragmentation of the churches it's not just a political reality, it's a sacramental reality. They are not in communion with one another. The other party, then, 
is not just wrong, he is heretical. He is not just under a different hierarchy, he is, is schismatic, or in the case of the Catholics, unit. He is not just an enemy. After all, we might have to love an enemy. He is anathema. He is devoid of grace. We are familiar with how this line of thinking has been used to delegitimize and dehumanize other religious groups, like the Jews. But it provides the same capabilities and temptations anytime there are such differences. This is especially true when there's a war going on and when religious institutions decide to make themselves a department of the state, as in the case in Russia. This is why there are Western and Ukrainian commentators who compare factions in the Russian Orthodox Church to fundamentalist Islamist groups like the Taliban, and why Russian and pro-Russian commentators do the same to Ukrainian Orthodox and Catholics. Moreover, the comparisons do have some merit, if only at the extremes. To add to this, you have this idea of Russia that it has taken upon itself that it is the center of Christendom. The first Rome collapsed, the second Rome fell into heresy and collapsed, and then the third Rome is Moscow, Russia, and there will never be a fourth, right? They take advantage of this idea and what, what Patriarch Kirill has called the Russian world, the Ruski Mir, Right? to legitimize the imperialism of Russia over Ukraine and over Belarus. And when the Maidan was going on and there was a lot of religious tension, one of the things that happened then and afterwards <laughs> is uh, the, the Russian patriarch, Kirill, sent a demarche, sent several of them, but he sent demarches to the ecumenical patriarch, Bartholomew in Constantinople, who is my patriarch, complaining about the way that schismatics and unions were conducting a religious war in Ukraine and trying to disrupt canonical Russian orthodoxy. And then we had the responses, and there were wonderful responses from the Ukrainian Catholic Church and from the Kievan Patriarchate explaining that no, that is not the case, that they are trying to be the pastors of all Ukraine and they are not involved in the conflict and it is not a religious war. Um, even the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under Moscow came out against this kind of imagery. Okay. So one more idea and that is the West their attitudes towards the West. Another way that Russia, using Russian Orthodoxy, de demonizes the other is in its treatment of the West. Russian politicians, agitators, and clergy continually present the West as decadent and anti-Orthodox. They did and do their best to present the choice between part of the Russian world and being part of the West as the choice between a moral future of strong traditional marriages and respect for Christianity, and one where Christian belief will be attacked and traditional marriage will be destroyed and replaced, of course, what's the big bugaboo? Gay marriage. In this Russian bizarro world, two of our most prized moral goals and achievements, we Westerners, human rights and democracy, are used pejoratively so often that they have become evidence of our corruption. You might think that our alliance with Russia, with the Soviet Union during the Great Patriotic War would undermine these attacks. However, formerly fascist Germany is our ally in the West, a connection that is made even more explicit when the Russian media claims that we have supported neo-Nazi groups in Ukraine. Moreover, they use that as just one piece of data, one more piece of evidence, in a long string of evidence of how we are conducting anti-Christian activities and wars throughout the world. The Ukrainian nationalists tend to see the West in more pragmatic terms. They recognize that it is the hope for rational government, a rational economy, and for the future. So let me conclude. How can we turn these swords into plowshares? 
Some think that the best way to solve this problem is to unite the Ukrainian Orthodox churches into one church, either under Moscow, by having the other groups come under the UOC MP, or under the Ecumenical Patriarch. And this is what the Ukrainian government has consistently asked my patriarch to do. And that would involve having the Ecumenical Patriarch put the Kievan Patriarchate or the autocephalist under its omophore. The idea that the newly united Ukrainian Orthodox Church would then be granted autocephaly or full independence from both Russia and Constantinople. And while I love this, I mean, a healthy autocephalous church would be good for Ukrainians and good for Ukraine. And it certainly deserves its own national church. But all of these paths, no matter how you draw it out, would be subject to Russian sabotage. We have already seen how the opportunism of senior Orthodox clergy can be used by Moscow to disrupt progress. And I'll just briefly mention two years ago, my bishops were involved with an effort to try to get two of the Orthodox groups to unite so it would be easier to have negotiations. And Russia continually meddled in those and sent to marshes complaining. Please know that this would get much worse if the Russian Orthodox Church was threatened with the loss of half its parishes and believers. It would rather risk the slow demise of its own church than risk that. And here I'm speaking not as a priest, but as a student of Soviet and Russian intelligence. We should have no doubt that Moscow has dossiers containing either real or fabricating compromising materials, kompromat, on all the major players in Ukrainian Orthodoxy. Nor should we doubt that it would use it to protect its interests. So what's the answer? What can we do? I don't have to describe to you the, the, the nature of the problem of the information, information war. Thanks to our own news cycle, you know, how, you know all about the troll farms, you know all about the manipulation of social media, and maybe you know even more than actually exists. It does get exaggerated. We know what we have to do here in order to minimize the damage. We also know the kinds of actions that are likely to make things worse. I'm sure that you've given this a lot of thought. This is central to us. And I look forward to hearing your ideas. All I can say is that the things we need to do to protect our culture and our institutions are the same sorts of things Ukraine should do. It's tempting to think of our openness as a weakness, and there is no doubt that it makes us vulnerable. But it is our commitment to freedom, not just freedom of religion, but of expression, mobilization, and entrepreneurship, not to mention our commitment to human rights and democracy that make us strong and resilient. We have given in to the temptation of the easy fix of authoritarianism in the past, and it remains a temptation for us now. I think this is always counterproductive in the medium to long term, not just for us, but for Ukraine, who has given in to this temptation as well. Speaking more specifically to the weaponization of orthodoxy, as a pastor, I can say that the way forward is clear. Just as the answer for America is to double down on freedom, the answer for the orthodox has to be to double down on the gospel. Loving our enemy begins with humility. We cannot love him unless we know him, and we cannot know him until we stop shouting and justifying ourselves and listen. This will bring an end to demonization and allow for real dialogue. This isn't a magic wand. <laughs> there are serious differences between the parties. It doesn't create new land, <laughs> but it will make finding a compromise possible. And at the very least, force politicians to find their own darn weapons. Because the quote from Metropolitan Nufri I shared at the beginning of my talk is right on the money. Clergy have no business using orthodoxy to divide God's children from one another. Let me leave you with this final reminder. We cannot fall into the trap of making invincible giants of President Putin, of Russia, or the Russian Orthodox Church. They are subject to pretty much the same limitations and pressures that we are and that our institutions are subject to. Even during the days of the old media, remember this, 
Moscow could not keep its efforts in Afghanistan from undermining its legitimacy at home. We have already seen similar mechanisms at work because of what it is doing in Ukraine, and the new media makes keeping secrets all but impossible. Moreover, generations of governmental lies have created a culture where, as Peter Pomerantsev recently put it, nothing is true and everything is possible. As a rule, Russians are very patient, but they are not stupid. They know that the government and its media machine cannot be trusted to tell the truth. Same for Ukrainians. Unfortunately, to the extent the church allows itself to be used as part of that media machine, it will not be trusted either. And that is the end of my prepared remarks. Thank you. Do I call you father? Most people do. Just don't call me life for dinner, right? <laughs> um, a long time ago, when I was visiting in um, Istanbul with a Greek friend, a Greek Orthodox friend, yeah. he asked my wife and me if we would like to meet the Greek Pope, the Patriarch. Yeah. And he took us, he had an audience with him. Now, is that the Pope, the Patriarch that you refer to? Yeah. That's yours. Yeah, so you so, went to the Fanar. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that's my, my patriarch. Okay. See, so um, when I talked about the divisions in Ukraine, I didn't even mention ours, right? I'm part of a group that um, was part of the autocephalus in the, you know, when communism first, Russia collapsed in the 20s. Uh, and then immigrants came with that, and it was rebuilt here and came under Constantinople. And, and Ukrainian Orthodox recognized Constantinople as their mother church because that's where they got the faith in, 19, in 988. It just looks like an, an extra complexity to the <laughs> fabric you painted. It does? To, for yeah. you, yes, Ukrainian yeah. Orthodox has, quote, the patriarch, their pope in well, Istanbul, in the, yeah. and then the rivals have it in Moscow. It's like two captive powers. Right, right. And those holding two, they are, they are vicious. Um, it's political. It gets political. Okay. And these, these are my fathers, right? So this is, I, I, I'm not going to get into it too much because that's, that's inside pool. But you may have, I don't know if you followed this in the news. There was an attempt by my patriarch to hold a great council to decide on some pressing matters. And... Russia used it as an opportunity to grandstand and, you know, play their trump card. You know, if you're not going to play our way, we're not going to come. They didn't come. They pressured other churches not to come. And so you had kind of a rump council. It was very unfortunate. This kind of thing just, just happened. I mentioned the Demarches. So when my, my bishops, they would go to Ukraine. What is a Demarche? Oh, Demarche. Um, it's, it means a, a letter of complaint. Yeah. And so... My bishops would go there. I mean, they go there to visit orphanages and stuff. That's, that's where their families are from, right? But their canonical territory is here, right? And it's complicated. And Russia complains, this is our canonical territory. You should get our permission and so on. Well, tell that to a Ukrainian Orthodox bishop that he has to get permission from the Russian patriarch to come visit his own country. It's pretty tough. And they had the blessing of the ecumenical patriarch. Um, to try and heal the divisions between two of the groups that are not canonical. That's all they were doing. Okay, it's Christian work, right? Healing the divisions. All right. Moscow complained. What are they doing here? They're, they're talking to uh, schismatics. <laughs> That's what they call the people we work with, schismatics. And, oh, one of their complaints was one of the great figures in, in recent Ukrainian history is uh, Patriarch Mstislav. And Patriarch Mstislav uh, was a great figure in, um, during World War II. He was a political leader, and he was widowed. And he, uh, he took ordination and became a bishop. And this, I'm going somewhere with this story, okay? And then he was chosen after the uh, religious freedom was allowed in the late Soviet Union. The autocephalous Ukrainian Orthodox Church 
came back and he was selected as their first patriarch. Okay? He was also our metropolitan here. So it was an interesting, you know, two hats. And here's the thing. He is seen as being, you know, we revere him. He is buried in the mausoleum under our memorial church in southbound Brook, New Jersey, the center of all things Ukrainian in America, right? And he's also revered by Patriarch Kirill, uh, Patriarch, sorry, Patriarch Filaret of the Kievan Patriarchate. He visited, he visited South Brook, and we took him to the mausoleum and we prayed the memorial, the, the prayers for the dead, right? Oh no, you can't pray with heretics and schismatics. So, Demarche, right? It's, it's really um, sad. But you're right, it is, it is kind of strange, right? Yeah. Since the large population in Ukraine speaks Russian, yeah. does Ukrainian church advocate to having services both in Ukrainian and Russian? That's one part of the question. And second part, does Ukrainian church recognize as gay marriages? Yeah, right, great questions. Okay, so with language, you know, language is always, that's where the rubber hits the road when it comes to, to national politics, right? <clears throat> Russia doesn't even allow the Russian church does not even allow Russian to be used in its own churches. No, it uses Slavonic, okay? So they, they preach in Russian, okay? But the service itself would be in church Slavonic, using the Russian pronunciation. In Ukraine, um, this was one of the, the great innovations of, of the church that I'm part of, this idea that, huh, maybe we should have the liturgy in a language people understand, right? So um, the nationalists, they, they serve in, um, in Ukrainian. And then the Moscow, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under Moscow, there's pastoral discretion that's allowed by the bishop. He can grant permission for it to be done in Slavonic or it to be done in Ukrainian. This is, this is one of the interesting things about the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarch. It's trying, it really is trying to be a place where Ukrainians and Russian-speaking Ukrainians can find a home. It's just very difficult because they're, they're under the occupying force, right? So they're, so they're tainted by that. Uh, as for gay marriage, no. No, it doesn't. And the, um, this, is, this, this is one of the things that groups like P Pussy Riot are, are pushing back against, right? That's why they went in there and, and violated the sacred space, was to get things like this on, on the radar. Um, but no, neither the, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church nor the Russian Orthodox Church um, support gay marriage. Now, how they deal with it, how they deal with, you know, real people in real situations varies a great deal. One of the unfortunate things that you see, this is me speaking personally, I'm not, I'm not speaking for my bishops or anything. One of the terrible things we see is um, kind of this return to fundamentalism. fundamentalism. And it's always tempting, but when there's a war on, um, there's a rally around the flagpole thing. And unfortunately for, for, for some people, that also means doubling down on, on some things that just um, are not good. Yeah. Uh, Father, uh, listening to all of this, and I know most of us don't know a great deal about orthodoxy, uh, but it seems to me that what I learned in history is basically what you're talking about here, that the different branches or sects or whatever you want to call them of every religion yep. is different, are different from each other and they have internal battles and religion has been the key to wars mm. and more deaths than most other forces. So what's different about what's happening now in Ukraine yeah, yeah, okay. than what has happened th in the world? Yeah, situation normal, right? I, I, do, I, I do just want to disagree. I mean, communism, you know, destroyed in the 20th century far more lives than, than religion did. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's sick because at, you, I can have a conversation about morality with a good atheist. We'll agree on the need to love your neighbor and so on. But when anything gets twisted, 
and, and you know, weaponized, uh, it's a tragedy. And for me, it's especially a tragedy when it comes to the weaponization of Christianity. Why is it that it gets so used so often in, in wars? It's because human beings are, are, are drawn to the sacred. And these things, that, because they're felt, that makes it like a, a, something that, that agitators can grab and manipulate you through, right? That's why. It's not because religion is a perverting influence. It's because it's, it's, you can use it. So what's the alternative? Is it to get rid of, of religion? No, there's still going to be things that can be manipulated. The answer is to teach discernment, to teach discernment, to teach love, to have people serving one another so that they recognize evil from good, no matter what words are used. That, that's what I try to do in my job. That's, that's my calling. Okay. I have this sense based on some primary resources I've read that during the Soviet times, orthodoxy was very much downplayed or even discouraged yeah. in the Soviet Union. Could you at all comment on the seemingly dramatic shift from this period of discouragement to a period today, as, as you've made the case, it can be, it's so ingrained in society, it can be weaponized. So how did we get from, from there to here? Right, yeah, fantastic. Because the Soviet project was to destroy religion Right? And it actively went about it. And it was effective at destroying the stuff of religion. I mean, there was, they, they, they got rid of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. They got rid of the Ukrainian autocephalic church. They martyred, they killed so many priests. They turned sacred spaces. They, they just mocked the Christians by turning them into stables and stuff, right? Okay, and then in World War II though, Stalin needed the church's support. And so that's when you had some toleration for it. And even then, though, let me just say how bad it was. Even what was left, they weren't allowed to preach. They weren't allowed to teach things like love. What were they allowed to do? They were allowed to hold services. They could have secret baptisms because you never wanted people to know you were baptized because you, then you wouldn't get the good jobs. And the leaders of the church were compromised. Okay? They, were, they were KGB. This is what the Soviet Union was like. It wasn't just them. It was, you know, half of everybody. All right, so how did, how did, what happened? Why is it now so available? Well, Russia was very effective when it came out of communism and had a huge identity crisis, okay? The loss of empire and the loss of this ideology. You know, what's the alternative? Nihilism was a huge threat. So what they did is they said, no, we've got this tradition. Orthodoxy. And multiculturalism, it's interesting how they do both, is going to be our new idea, right? And so they, they funded, they rebuilt zillions of churches, the oil money, you know, just builds mosques and everywhere else, and it builds churches in Russia. Um, so that's, that's why. And in, in Ukraine, the western part of Ukraine was not under the Soviet Union for those, all that, those terrible years. It had a different experience. So it's available for maybe different reasons. Okay, but that's why, because we've, we've had since 1989, basically, certainly 1991, for these ideas to come back in, and they've, they've really gravitated towards them and, and loved them. Yeah. Yes, I, first of all, I wish to thank you very much for a wonderfully comprehensive and extraordinarily interesting presentation. Beyond that, uh, could you explain to us how those civilizations in those countries, Ukraine, Russia, Crimea, the whole part of Asia influenced by Russia, how they adapt to the Western belief, or at least attempt, to separate church from state. Ah, uh, boy. You know, this is one of the things I love about being a Westerner is, is that we do have this. We have a place for pluralism to work, you know, where you learn to listen to other people who are not like you. This is not, it's not natural. <laughs> it's taken a lot of effort, and we have to spend a lot of time defending it, right? Um, and in general, let me, uh, in general, the rush is, Russia is very skeptical of the West. 
When you visit, I visited Moscow in, in 96, and it was awful. It was um, prostitutes and gambling, and you know, it was, it was terrible, right? It was all the things that we, we don't like to see writ large, right? So it was, it was the Wild West of unconstrained capitalism, okay? You had pyramid schemes, you had all, I mean, just the worst, honestly, the worst. And so there's a huge distrust, right? We tried that. <laughs> we tried that. And then as far as church and the separation of church and state goes, it's, it's just not part of it. They, they do try to do this, this it's not pluralism. It's, it's more, um, you know, we respect these major traditional religions because they exist within our country. You know, Islam, Buddhism, orthodoxy. Um, but it's not a secular space. That's not where they meet. In fact, the state sees itself as the protector and guarantor of each of those, right? So they have, you're not allowed to offend someone's religious belief. As long as it's a legitimate religious belief, you can't offend it. Okay, that's, that's different, okay? And it's not just a difference of degree, it's a difference of kind, because it comes from a different place, right? If we did that, it would still be on, I don't want us to do it, but it would still be on top of, you know, a, a, a foundation of, of freedom. Um, it's not the case there. Okay. Right. Father, I have a uh, geography question. Oh, no, I'm going to fail this. <laughs> uh, a number of us have visited in New York City. Uh, I think 79th. Uh, okay, boss. Uh, uh, 79th and 5th Avenue, a Ukrainian house, a beautiful mansion with full of art and uh, similar things. Which of the five organizations does that mansion belong to? I have never been there. I, I'm from Georgia. I make it a rule not to go to New York City. <laughs> um, I, I am 99% sure that that is Ukrainian Catholic. Okay, the Ukrainian Catholics are very well organized and they, they are in strongly in support of their culture. Okay, that would be my guess. Yes, sir. Can we go to Bob Fullerton? We have time for another question. We'll go to David Lewis. I'm a Lutheran and we've uh, just recently celebrated our 500th uh, yes. anniversary of the Reformation. And our bishop was talking about reconciliation after all those centuries with the Catholic Church. Yeah. And there's lots that's gone on between the Lutheran and the Catholic Church. Yeah. So I listened to what you were saying and I almost see some parallels. Right. Ukrainian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. So I have two questions. Am I right in seeing those parallels? And secondly, the real politic in me wants to ask the question about this little thing called the Civil War. What is it going to take to have that end? And what is the role of a church in doing that? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the reconciliation, this is tough. It's going to take humility. Somebody's got to, you know, eat crow. And while, let me, let me tell you something. Here's some hope, okay? The two first saints from Rus that were canonized, that were recognized as saints, were Boris and Kleb, or Boris and Gleb, is the way you're probably used to hearing it. Okay, Boris and Kleb. And they were sainted for a very particular reason. It wasn't because they were great theologians or you know, radiated light or anything like that. It's because when it was time for an internecine war, when it was time for a civil war, these two brothers had a legitimate case to make for them to be in charge. And one of them even had an army with them. And what they did instead, they said, for the peace of our land, we will accept martyrdom. For the peace of our land, we're going to let go of our claim. Okay? And you can imagine why these two were sainted early on, right? Because the authorities pick who's going to be sainted. You know, that's a great example for everybody but me. <laughs> And so we, we do have that, you know, if we can just make that resonate, you know, as much as the other stuff. Sorry about that sound guy. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so there, there is hope for the end of the Civil War, but that's the kind of thing it will take. Okay. That, and, and Rustow says, eventually they'll get tired of fighting each other and that'll lead to democracy. So, maybe. Okay, as far as the re re reconciliation goes, I, I'm so, by this time I'm kind of jaded. Um, I have hope. I don't expect it to see it before the eschaton, you know, um, because, I mean, they were this close to getting the Kiev Patriarchate and the Autocephalus together. They had agreed. They had agreed on everything. They were going to sign it the next day. And the next day, the Autocephalus came in and said, no, we changed our mind. Okay. Um, the, we have ongoing talks, speaking of your Lutheran, Lutheran, uh, Lutheran Catholic dialogue, we have ongoing talks with the Catholics. Um, and the best ones are the ones, my favorites, are the ones between the Ukrainian Orthodox and Ukrainian Catholics, because we worship the same, you know, we have the same theology, all of this. So it's like getting together with brothers who are, you know, on the other side of the Mason-Dixon line or something like that. Now, not, not then. Um, <laughs> so, you know. Um, but let me, let me just tell you how ugly this gets. Okay, so at a Ukrainian, I mean, at a Catholic Orthodox dialogue, universal world, right? The, the Russian Orthodox representative, their primary ambassador, Metropolitan Ilarion, a very learned man, okay, a composer, you know, a great man, comes in there and he attacks the, or the, the Catholic Church and specifically the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Why? Well, the usual accusations, oh, they're supporting fascists and so on, but also just because they are. He says their very presence is an offense. It's just a tool to undermine canonical orthodoxy. Y'all, these guys have been around for 400 plus years. They're not just anything. They are, right? And, and to treat them as if they were some kind of, you know, tactic to undermine the orthodox is just it's not just disingenuous, it's uncharitable. It's unchristian. That's, that's me. And, and when this video gets out, I'm going to get a lot of heat for this. <laughs> okay, David, you can ask a short question. We'll give it to you. Uh, there's a microphone. Uh, there was a lot of clerical politics in your, yeah, in your sorry. talk. <laughs> and it, it reminded me, I lived in Jerusalem for, or in, in Israel for three oh, years. Yeah. And it reminded, reminded me of the maladministration of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Yes. Uh, among the, oh, uh, it's a scandal. Uh, <laughs> the various denominations. Yeah. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, for about a year, I was very much taken with a Russian uh, philosopher named uh, Nicholas Berdyayev. Oh, yeah. Who yeah. I saw when the fall of the Soviet Union took place, his name came up and uh, there was some interest in him. Yeah. Now, I once had a very short but uh, very uh, uh, sharp uh, uh, and interesting conversation with the Russian historian uh, Richard Pipes uh -huh. uh, and asked him about Berdyaev, and he kind of dismissed him. He said, I remember the term he used to describe him was muddled, <laughs> which there's something to be said for that. But Berdyaev did have what he gave to me was this vision of orthodoxy as a universalist faith yeah. uh, with great potential to transform people. A, one of his books is called The Russian Idea. Right. Yep. He, had, he identifies yep. very much Russian nationalism with, with uh, uh, orthodoxy uh, yeah. uh, in, in, in that book. And uh, anyway, I was quite taken with him uh, for that period. The, the question is simply, are these ideas, these universalist ideas, I mean, he made reference, for instance, to Dostoevsky. Now, we know Dostoevsky had a dark side, his yeah, yeah. Jew hatred, uh, among yeah. other things. Yeah. But he did have a vision of Beauty a powerful world. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. salvationist uh, culture. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's there. Is, the, is, it's it, there. is this it's something there. that is yeah. at all active in these, okay, so in I these focused difficult... on, on the politics and yeah. stuff, but please know this. I mean, clergy, Patriarch Kirill, all these guys, that's what they're really about. They get pulled into this other stuff. 
Like, I'm willing to say that Patriarch Kirill's Russian, Russian world, Ruski Mir, that he, let's just be generous, he meant no harm. But then Putin takes it and uses it, weaponizes it, right? You know, and once it's out there, it can be used by anybody. But there are some ideas that can't be manipulated so easily, and those are the ones that we should really focus on. Charity, humility, love, sacrificial service. Yeah, and that's, it's there. It really is. Yep. Thank you very much. Well, now I know that Ukraine conflict is even more complicated than I thought it was. So we thank you, uh, Father Anthony, for bringing it out in its full complexity. We thank all of you for coming tonight. Uh, as you know, our annual dinner is next Tuesday. We are actually very quickly running out of space, so act quickly if you haven't yet signed up for the dinner. Uh, good to see you. Thanks for coming out on this uh, rainy night, and see you soon. <laughs>